Okay, Energy 808, the cutting edge here on Monday, Monday at noon. Wow, with Marco Mangelsdorf. He joins us from Hilo, from ProVision Solar. Hi, Marco. Pleasure to be back with you, my friend. Uh, in the words of the mamas and the papas, Monday, Monday, exactly. what would it be without Jay? I, I didn't know you had a voice. This is a whole new world. We have to do more music together, you know, because energy in a funny way is music. It's music to your ears, it's music to the world, music to society in general. But let's talk I about the, our, the music we've our, had. Our right? harmonies, I think, would, would turn the world on its ear, Jay. <laughs> we'll leave that for further definition, what that means. <laughs> so what is the solar prognosis, um, Doctor? is the title of our show, but we have much more to cover than that. So the first item I'd like to cover with you is energy politics in the 808 building on solar and on prime ag land. Uh, prime ag land, that is very interesting. So what is happening in the square building on prime ag land this session? Well, I, I don't want to leave any viewers uh, with uh being in too anxious of a state in terms of the prognosis, uh, what's the solar prognosis, doctor, question mark. And uh, I've given this some thought, and it's guarded. It's guarded. Okay, so we'll, I'll just put that out there for now. We can come back to it. Uh, in terms of recent activity there at that beautiful Capitol building uh, regarding the question, should uh, grade A prime agricultural land uh, in the state, uh, which is makes up, uh, I believe, a very small percentage, fairly small percentage of all ag lands, and I believe it goes from A to E, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. with uh, A being the best of the best and E being the not so good of the good. Uh, that there was uh, an effort on the part of uh, Hanwha. Hanwha is a South Korean-based uh, big company that uh, was behind. Uh, installing a, you know, a utility scale, I believe 50 megawatt solar, commercial solar, uh, utility scale solar project on prime ag land, uh, A-grade ag land on Oahu. And there was um, a bill that was making its way through the ledge that would have essentially allowed that to happen because the, the way the law stands now, you cannot put solar, commercial utility, industrial uh, grade solar on prime ag land. And fortunately, uh, I'm relieved, even though there are some uh, disagreements and differing of opinions between, let's see, my, my view and my friend Richard Ha, who's the co-director there of the Hawaii Energy Coalition, Hawaii Island Energy Cooperative. Uh, there were some some folks on the ag side who wanted to wanted to see that happen, uh, and there was some talk of well, you can combine solar and you can combine ag uh, on the same property, uh, but ultimately the legislature. Uh, deferred indefinitely, which effectively kills the bill. So uh, Hanwha is moving on, and they said, well, we've, we've junked that idea anyway, and we're going to move on to a different different proposed piece of land to do that. So uh, as I think we've talked about before, there's no doubt in my mind that food security is just as important as energy security. So when there's plenty of other parcels out there that are B grade and, and, and less in terms of ag land, uh, I, I see no compelling reason whatsoever to start sacrificing prime ag land, even though agriculture, in terms of growing food and crops and uh, other ways of making us food more food secure, even though that's become quite a hard push in terms of economics, uh, I think the last thing we want to do is just start encroaching on the best ag lands that we have and essentially kind of cannibalize from the inside out and, and devote that to, to renewable energy. So uh, they, they made the right call. Yeah, but suppose it was, um, you know, grade Z agricultural lands, and it was not prime. How would you feel about that? Um, I'm, I'm okay with that, and I think it's already been happening. I mean, the law states that, I, again, I, I don't know the law inside and out, but I'm pretty sure that the only ag land that is not zoned or permitted for solar parks, so to speak, or solar arrays, commercial solar, utility scale solar, is, is, is grade A. I think everything from B below, I believe, is fair game. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple, of, a couple of thoughts about that. I remember a project which is operating now, was out in the Kapolei area, which had been um, a, um, a dump. Uh, it was, a, it was uh, 
contaminated materials. It was a, you know, EPA, you know, qualified dump of contaminated materials. And uh, Hawaiian Electric, and I forget the name of the organization that was uh, doing it, um, uh, might have been Hoku, might have been Hoku. Anyway, these guys um, built a, uh, a solar farm um, on that land. And uh, they didn't want to penetrate the land, penetrate the soil, because there were contaminants just below that. So they, they made a, a kind of membrane um, on, on the land, and then they, they sort of uh, put the structural members of the solar system on the membrane. It was actually removable. I mean, they could take it apart, too, and they could move it somewhere else. Um, and I thought that was a pretty good idea because you're using land that you couldn't use for anything else. You certainly could not use this land for um, agriculture. And nobody, you know, they'd have to go through an EPA process to use it for anything else, really. Um, but they could use it for solar. And it was, you know, it was a substantial parcel. I thought, what a great way to handle, you know, the EPA contaminated land. And um, um, that, I, you know, that somehow, somehow relates to this. We have a lot of land we can't use at all for agriculture, for any kind of agriculture. Uh, why can't we use that? The sun shines the same way on all of it. And um, uh, I don't know why we have to consider either prime agricultural land or any other kind. That's one factor. The other factor is, you know, I mean, this is all, this is all kind of mm, ironic because we're not really incentivizing uh, diversified agriculture in this state. We have precious little of it. You know, since the days of the plantations, the amount of land that's dedicated to, that's being used in economically, you know, profitable agriculture in the state is really manini. Um, so, um, yes, certainly we should be careful about um, taking land out of agriculture, but the fact is um, that it's only theoretical because we're not incentivizing agriculture. How do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, you kind of lost me a little bit in the run-up to the question, Jay. Sorry to be so dense. Could you? Could I'm you just reacting. It? I'm reacting to the whole set of set of circumstances. I'm reacting in two ways. One is you don't have to use agricultural land at all because there's lots of other kind of land that isn't agriculture, and in fact, it it's a contaminated land um, and that can't be used for agriculture or anything. Um, and um, my second reaction is, uh, uh, which is not necessarily in the same direction, my second reaction is, gee, what are we so concerned about agricultural land? The fact is we're not incentivizing it. So in a perfect world, in a perfect world, A, uh, we wouldn't use any agricultural land for, for solar. We, there's so many other parcels available um, that are easier to use and that would have, you know, that would, that would be beneficial without, without affecting agriculture. And, and B, we should be incentivizing agriculture. We're not doing that. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a grand plan that should be made here, and it's not. Oh, I couldn't agree more with uh, especially the latter part of what you said in terms of the, the effective relative demise of ag across the state of Hawaii. I mean, you can look back on the decades and decades of sugarcane as well as monocrop. I mean, we were, the state was, was, uh, not adequately uh, diversified in that we were doing sugarcane for decades, we were doing pineapples for decades, and both of those, of course, have largely, you know, more or less completely gone away. And I mean, the, the reality is, of course, is that we, the, the whole state is very, very, very dependent on, you know, those barges coming in day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out, with, uh, with perishables from far, far away that keep the, the food on the shelves in the stores, right? So. That, that is seen by many, many people, and you and I included, uh, as being a great vulnerability, just as much of a vulnerability as we are to the supply lines that bring in the oil that traverses thousands and thousands of miles from east and from westerly directions. So what can and should be done to incentivize ag? I mean, uh, this is not something I've taken a deep dive into, but I'm absolutely convinced that more needs to be done. And again, I look, go back and look at my friend Richard Hobb, who he had on his farm just north in Pepekeo area, Northwest, going up Hamakua Coast, not far from Hilo. Richard was a banana and tomato farmer for decades, 
and he first gave up tomatoes because the cost of refurbishing his, uh, his greenhouses and so forth went up high enough that he didn't see enough of a payoff to spend a substantial amount of money to continue to grow tomatoes. So he gave up on tomatoes. And then, sadly, he felt he needed to get out of doing bananas, which he'd done for decades and decades. So I see people like Richard Haw and a whole bunch of others who dedicated their lives to farming and who got out because of financial concerns and constraints. So what can the state do to incentivize more farming? Uh, I, I don't know because, again, I haven't taken that deep dive into the subject matter, but there's no doubt in my mind that there should be a heck of a lot more uh, motivation and incentive to be able to support. Yeah, well, my, my point is, you know, on the one hand, we have solar and clean energy. On the other hand, we have farming. And there's no reason why the, uh, the, the uh, farmers and the ranchers can't be friends. Um, that you right. can have both of them. There's no question we can have both of them. So if, as a matter of policy, we decide that to be sustainable, um, this state needs farming and ranching. It needs solar and it needs, it needs uh, diversified agriculture, both. And if you and I Absolutely. sat in a room for a little while, Marco, I am sure we could figure out how to incentivize both of them. Um, and that's the mission. These are very important things going forward. We're going to have storms. We're going to have disruptions. We have to make ourselves uh, sustainable. And frankly, we're not doing that. But that's another story. Yes. Let's go on to, uh, let's go on to HB 307 and the... Uh, the application of the famous gut and replace technique. Can you tell us what's happening in the square building about that one? The square building, yeah, I like the way you put that. Uh, so there was a bill that was introduced on the House side that uh, at the beginning of the session, which is, you know, mid-January, that was uh, House Bill 307. And House Bill 307 was to get into the definition of what constitutes renewable energy. And you think, well, you know, renewable energy should be a fairly easy slam dunk, Mr. President, right? What does renewable energy mean? But uh, there was a number of legislators decided that the state's definition of, quote, renewable energy was too narrow to account for what they described as some technological innovations that produce renewable energy resources. Well, I guess that sounds all well and good. Uh, but they wanted to try to uh, push the envelopes of uh, some, I guess. And uh, you know, there was some discussion about whether nuclear was uh, uh, renewable energy, in a sense. And in FYI, you probably know, it specifically states in Hawaii's constitution, no nukes, no nukes, no nukes, no nukes. So well, what, what, it says, what it says in the constitution is you, you can't have a nuclear permit, a nuclear facility, without having a three-quarter vote of both houses of the legislature, which is not likely to happen. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, that's, that's an important one. Uh, it also wanted to address the, uh, the, the, I don't know how to describe this, kind of quasi-energy source of, of cool commercial seawater air conditioning, commercial seawater air conditioning, yeah. which involves taking uh, substantial amounts of water from substantial depths, because once you go below X number of hundreds of feet, let alone thousands of feet, you get a pretty constant water temperature somewhere in the 50s. So if you can pump up a lot of water, pump it up, and circulate it round and round and round and round, and use that as a means of, of cooling the air for office building and hotels and condos and so forth, mm -hmm. then that makes sense, apparently, as opposed to burning coal and the AES power plant, or oil and other HECO power plants to produce electricity to run uh, compression um, uh, air conditioning systems. Yeah. So the, it was an effort to, 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 to look at, OK, what is actually, you know, what, you know, what energy sources can be legitimately defined as renewable energy. So I mean, it, that, that's a reasonable thing to do, right? Plus, you know, it's being pushed by those commercial seawater air conditioning proponents who, who see the possibility of, of selling more of their products and uh, because they've been more incentivized, let's say, through the renewable energy technologies investment tax credit. So reasonable, reasonable thing to do. Uh, but because a, another bill, Senate Bill 1163, if I remember correctly, uh, died in the Senate uh, that would have redone the renewable energy tax credit and essentially put sunset dates on it because right now the solar tax credit, the wind tax credit, 
uh, have no sunset date, and it's 35% with certain caps. So that particular bill, 1163, died in the House this past, these past week. And the folks behind Senate Bill 1163, Senator Glenn Wakai, for one, and others decided that they didn't want to just let that die, and uh, they used their, their gut and uh, replace magic to turn HB 307 from a strictly speaking defined renewable energy uh, bill and, and, and add on to that uh, what would in effect be the ramp down, the ramp down of the Renewable Energy Technologies Investment Tax Credit. So that is what was heard, uh, HB 307 was heard by three committees, count them, three committees last week, three committees at once because time is a running short. Well, that is extraordinary. Three committees in one week, huh? Extraordinary. Yeah. No, no there was, it was the tri-committee meeting. It yeah. wasn't one committee, two committees, three committees, yeah. you know, sequentially. It was all three of them yeah. at once. Yeah. They're running out of time. Yeah. So they passed, uh, they passed HB 307, Senate Draft 1 or SD 1, uh, out of those three committees, all senators except one, Jay, all senators except one either voted yes, or weren't there, and just one voted no, and that was my good friend Russell Ruderman, Senator Russell Ruderman, who, who covers the uh, Puna and south the part of the island yeah. district. Yeah. So Russell voted against it, so I, I, I applaud him for doing that. And what, is, what would SD1 do? Uh, well, it uh, would specifically uh, outlaw, well, no, not outlaw, but let's see, other, self, other self-replenishing non-fossil fuel, comma, non-nuclear resources. So it specifically takes nuclear out of the picture. There was a bunch of pushback on anything having to do with nuclear. Mm -hmm. And it starts the ramp down of the tax credits, uh, the solar, the renewable energy Technologies and Investment Tax Credit, oh, that's a mouthful, I always stumble over when I say it. Uh, so it would keep the existing tax credit at 35% with various caps up until the end of 2023, and then starting January 1st, 2024, it would, stop, it would start a drop down to 20% and, and, uh, and start uh, essentially reducing that incentive. So uh, this will be voted on by the Senate writ large, and I assume it's going to pass, and then it will go to uh, you know, the so-called conference committee because HB 307 that was voted on by the House is, will be different than HB 307 mm. Senate Draft 1 mm. that was voted on by the Senate, and it will go to a conference committee where you'll have uh, Rep. Nicole Lowen from the Kona side, who's chair of the Energy and Environment Committee on the House side, and have Glenn Wakai, who's chair of the Energy Blah, 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 committee on the Senate side and a number of other participants who will see whether some type of uh, compromise uh, between the two different versions is possible. And uh, if it's not possible, then it will die in, in conference, just mm -hmm. as similar bills have died in conference last year and the year before and the year before. You haven't mentioned so, the, the storage uh, provision, the provision that allows a tax credit for storage that is added on to an existing solar facility. What, is that in this bill? Well, that's a very, very sore subject for me, my friend. No, it's not. It, uh, that didn't make it past the first committee. And uh, what you're referring to is expanding the Renewable Energy Technologies Investment Tax Credit to include a provision to allow for a state tax credit of, let's say, 25% with, with caps for the, to support the addition of storage to existing renewable energy systems. And why that's the case or why that was taken out uh, is unclear to me. My impression is that there is a greater concern this year compared to last year in terms of the state's finances and the hits, various hits on the general fund. And that you know, the Department of Taxation takes, in my opinion, a rather um, worst case scenario planning in terms of, well, how much would this particular new tax credit possibly take out of the state's general fund? And then you know, they're, they're trying to guard the, the taxpayers' dollars and cents. I get that. But I find the lack of, of a prioritizing of adding storage to existing systems, renewable systems, both on the utility side of the meter and the customer side of the meter, to be incredibly short-sighted and incredibly lamentable that this is not seen as a priority because, as I've told you a number of times, 
and I really do believe this, that we are living on borrowed time in the state, that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when one of our islands or more of our islands will be hit by a category three, four, or five hurricane, and then the hand wringing and, oh, woe is us, why didn't we do more to fortify our grids to make them more micro gridish when we could to be able to have a more robust and resilient grid that could take, take hurricane hits without getting Puerto Rico eyes as we witnessed a couple years ago in, in, in that area of the world. Well, we so, can still refer that, to Puerto that, Rico because it's still having huge problems. It, it is really beyond, beyond belief how, how little the federal government has done to help Puerto Rico. And so, you know, uh, we're, we're wondering, you know, I'm wondering, uh, in, in a storm, everybody thinks that, oh, the military will come in, the federal government will come in, FEMA will come in. No, we have living proof that it may not come in. Uh, and so we're not in a sustainable, uh, you know, position at all. Um, and so it's really too bad that we don't have a we don't have a real goal here in terms of renewables. We don't have a real plan. Um, critical policy issues is going to be left for the conference committee on this. Um, that's not the way to do it. Um, the way to do it is to have a plan. And that takes us to the second part of our show, Marco. Um, the Senate passed six energy and agricultural. And current resolutions, SCR, introduced by Senator Dela Cruz, who's the chair of the Senate Committee on Ways and Means. But they're resolutions; they're not bills. Can we talk about those? Sure, sure. I'm always, uh, you know, passing a resolution is uh, is to me kind of a feel good thing to do because they certainly don't have the same oomph as a bill does, which could conceivably be signed into law by by the governor. And uh, it's more kind of a sense of the body, a sense of the senator, a sense of the house. So uh, I just kind of, and this is again thanks to Henry Curtis, who was uh, you know keeps up on a regular daily basis in terms of energy and environment stuff. So uh, you know, kudos to Henry for continuing his his good work. But uh, one of those resolutions uh, was requesting the governor to prioritize the planting of four million trees along streets and roadways within the next four years to help address climate change and make complete streets uh, statewide. Uh, so, I mean, who, who can be against planting a bunch more trees? Just well, it's like, it's like yeah. motherhood. It's like motherhood, but it's, it's a resolution, not a bill. There's no money attached to it. Um, the governor has no budget for it. Um, he's not going to do it. Um, four million trees cost a lot of money. This is pie in the sky. Do you agree with me? I do. And, you know, kind of the next, uh, the next uh, Senate resolution uh, urges the governor in coordination uh, with the DLNR, Department of Land and Natural Resources, to establish and implement a tree planting program. Who would be against establishing a, a tree planting program? Program. I is, mean, is this going to prompt the governor to go ahead and establish and implement a tree planting program? Well, the answer is no. There's no money for it. It's not a statute. It's a resolution. It's wishful thinking. I, I don't think this, either of these resolutions we've talked about are going to mean anything. But I guess it feels good. And uh, if you put it in the newspaper, there'll be people out there that think, oh, we're going to have four million trees. We're going to have a tree planting program. All beautiful. And it is beautiful. They're going to be wrong. We def definitely should do this. We should do it as part of a plan that has teeth, that actually goes forward, that's funded, that has departmental responsibility. These, these resolutions don't have any of that. What else? Well, another one is uh, requesting the Department of Agriculture designate areas in each county for dairy operations and develop incentives to increase dairy operations in the state. And you probably know, Jay, that you know, not too long ago, there were dozens of, of farm, uh, there were dozens of dairies across the state producing locally produced milk and cheese products. And now there are, I think that we have one, one, one left, one or two left in the whole state. And Ulupono tried for years and spent substantial amount of money trying to establish a dairy operation on Kauai. And ultimately, they threw up their hands after spending probably easily millions and millions of bucks because the pushback from folks on Kauai, nimbyism to the max, uh, amongst other reasons, pushback, pushback, pushback. So Lupono threw up their hands and gave up. So yeah, it's all well and good to say, well, let's, let's have the agriculture promote 
scary operations, but you look in the real world and what you know Ulupono tried to do on Kauai, and uh, who in their right mind, after looking at what happened on Kauai, is going to say, yeah, I'm willing to spend millions of bucks to try to get dairy going. So again, there's a disconnect here. You know, it's, it's all well and good to say, oh, well, let's just do more dairy operations, but the real world is the, 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 the terrain is treacherous, ter terribly treacherous out there. Yeah, well, in terms of trying to do this, something this like actually that. reminds me of Super Ferry. Super Ferry was a great idea, and to the extent that it did get anywhere, I mean, by, by private industry, by Wall Street, um, you know, it was a remarkable improvement to the transportation system in the state. But there were activists who opposed it, and they killed it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, a tribute to their activism, but it doesn't help the people. And it's radioactive. And I'm not referring back to nuclear now. I'm re referring to radioactive political. And so what happened is nobody will touch, nobody will touch Super Ferry or any ferry again. Wall Street's not going to touch it, and state government's not going to touch it. In our lifetimes and the lifetimes of our children, I don't think there'll be a, a ferry of any kind in the state of Hawaii. Very sad story. And the likewise, what happened in Kauai was tragic. You're right, it was nimbyism by condo and, um, you know, uh, uh, recently arrived uh, land buyers and by the, the hotels. So the hotel was there. We don't like the, the smell of the cows. And, and they generated a whole big opposition. And in the end of the day, they put so much pressure on the county of Kauai and the state uh, that, that, that a dairy was impossible. And so we don't have that dairy. We could have had that dairy. It was well-intentioned by Piero Meteor, and he did sink a lot of money into it, but he never, could able, he never was able to bring in cow one. Um, and, and the message, the message to the people, to other investors, to Wall Street, what have you, to entrepreneurs who might consider a dairy is, don't try this. This is radioactive politically. And so uh, I think uh, this... this this resolution doesn't go anywhere because nobody is going to try it after that. I agree with you totally. What I else got we another got? one for you here, Jay. Yeah. Uh, SCR-157 requesting the Department of Agriculture to develop a sustainable food security strategic plan. Food security, sustainable food security strategic plan. Who in the world could be against that? Where's the money going to come from to do that? Well, you know, we have a planning office in DBED. Uh, I mean, my first reaction to seeing this one is, don't we, don't, don't we already have a plan? What is the planning office doing? Uh, the, you know, this is, this is central planning sent at the center of the state's interest. And, and, and you know, we, we absolutely need a plan like this. Um, and, and now we have a resolution, not a, not a bill, not an act. We have a resolution, wishful thinking, that we should have a plan, and let's see, who is supposed to do it? Um, the State Energy <laughs> Office, that's within DBED. But, you know, this isn't going to go anywhere either. You have, to, uh, you have to fund it. You have to have staff. I'm not sure, right. we, need, I'm not sure we need planners from out of state. I think that, that a particular approach has not really worked. Um, but at least we could develop a, uh, an organization within DBED that could actually make a plan. I mean, or take the existing planning office or take the existing energy office and actually have them sit down and write a plan. And then it could be approved by, you know, whatever agencies are involved or by the legislature. And then we have something to follow. And, and so when you get into the, you know, any given session, people can look to that plan and say, yeah, we got a plan. We should implement the plan with legislation. But that's not going to happen here either, is it? Well, speaking of plans, this is kind of a good segue talking about DBED, which is that uh, uh, I heard when I was at the energy conference, the Hawaii energy conference, not Maui energy conference, but the Hawaii energy conference on Maui a couple weeks ago, uh, that the DBED folks in the energy office, uh, Carolyn Schoen and, and Chris Yunker, uh, who are two of the fine employees there, that the report that the legislature did fund several years ago of a million dollars and change to look at utility, electric utility ownership models in the state, that that report, which was received by DBED sometime in January, that the public has yet to lay its eyes on because it has yet to be released, that report should be coming out fairly soon, as in mid-April. And now, by my calendar, we're the 8th of April, so we're a week or so away from mid precisely mid-April, 
And that is an example of not just the resolution, but a bill that was passed and signed by the governor to appropriate state fund money to look at utility ownership models. So it's going to be very interesting to see what comes out of this uh, London Economics International report that they, you know, spent a considerable amount of time and effort and obviously state money to do a report on looking at utility ownership models. So that's something which I'm, I'm really hoping will be forthcoming uh, very soon. Not, well, you know, I tell you the truth, uh, that the it's too little, too late. Um, that report uh, was uh, was initiated more than two years ago. We we never heard boo about what it says or does, and it was done by somebody outside the state. I really wonder how useful that is because Hawaii is unique uh, in the way it's organized and its politics and its social structure, and for that matter, its energy structure. So um, I'll be interested to see what happens, but I doubt it's going to go anywhere. Um, and finally, is this thing that the last. Uh, the last, um, what is it, uh, uh, Senate current resolution, concurrent resolution 126, urging the governor, Department of Agriculture, the University of Hawaii, and all right-thinking individuals, uh, and, the, and the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. I'm, I'm never sure why human resources involved in the top of the, top of the College of Tropical Agriculture. And other related entities, not named, to take action to expand aquaculture in our state. You know, Marco, you and me, we've been following this whole sustainability thing, and uh, the, the term aquaculture has been in play for 20 years at least, maybe 30, maybe 40, and, and uh, we're going to expand it now. Uh, it was always a good idea, but it had, has had precious little expansion in all these years. Uh, there was an aquaculture coordinator at the university. He's gone. Um, there has been really no initiative moving aquaculture forward, and I, I'm really sad to, to say that uh, this is, again, too little, too late. What do you think? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there, there's so many competing priorities, you know, to, to, to state kind of the obvious, and I, I wonder sometimes, I mean, homelessness certainly is a, is a screening priority. It's very visible. It's very painful for, obviously, the people who don't have homes and pay for, pay, painful for businesses who are impacted, individuals who are impacted by people sleeping near or near, uh, on or near sidewalks. So it, it's, there just seems to be so much to do, so little time, relatively you know, inadequate resources, and, of course, my... You know, my axe to grind is on the energy side, and I completely respect others who are toiling away for food security, toiling away for rights of homeless folks and so forth. And uh, it just seems like we could, uh, there's, there's always more that we can do in a, in, a, in a more timely fashion. And just another little tidbit I'll share with you before we go is uh, the Senate voted uh, in favor of uh, Leo Asuncion, who uh, will be taking his place along with uh, uh, Dr. Jay Griffin and Jenny Potter uh, at the Public Utilities Commission as of, I believe, he, he comes on board in the first day or two of May. So we'll be back up to full strength after five months of Randy Wasse's retirement late last year with uh, Jay and Jenny and Leo. So um, hoping for great things from our commission uh, and hopefully uh, you know, the, the addition of Leo will uh, add uh, positively to uh, to the commission. That's great. That's good news. And the PUC is in good shape. Uh, but it, it remains that we need a larger plan. We need to focus on where the state is going in terms of sustainability and the economy. I was, uh, I was happy to see that, um, that um, was a community foundation gave uh, uh, a substantial grant to Civil Beat uh, to examine diversification of the economy. Um, and it's reporting on that for a year, I think, with a sort of deep, a deep study about uh, diversification of the economy. But I'd like to add, that is merely a, a reportage. Um, that is merely an inquiry by the press. Um, fact is that there's nothing going on about diversification of the economy uh, at DBED. So I hope maybe they see uh, the handwriting on the wall, the need to do something. I hope Civil Beat encourages EBED to do something about diversifying the economy. We spent the first 10 years of this century, um, I say we, I mean the tech industry, uh, trying to you know, sell diversification into technology, and I would say we did not succeed in that regard. Maybe Back just- Back to one five, right? 
two two one act two two one two two one sorry yeah right, that was a, right. a huge uh, a huge failure it was a, a situation where the Caetano administration came up with a pretty good bill uh, and then the Lingle administration pulled a rag, rug out from under it and in so many ways that by 2010 it was gone 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 and um, and not only gone but radioactive again so what we have is um, no planning and we have Small efforts at good things that become somehow radioactive, and nobody tries them again. And then it's time for another election with a new generation of legislators. So there right. you have it. There you have it, Marco. Say goodbye to the people, Marco. Goodbye to the people, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> Great discussion. So, so valuable to have these conversations with you, Marco. I hope it stirs a little interest somewhere. I think it will. Rock my Monday. You always rock my Monday and, and, and then some, my friend. <laughs> we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Marco. Okay. Mahalo. Mahalo.